Thought Leadership from PwC. Welcome to PwC's Accounting Podcast. I'm Heather Horn. Today's special episode is focused on a hot topic, Pillar 2 Taxes, a topic that we've discussed before, but one that warrants an update given recent developments and its potentially broad impact. Yeah, the best practice companies, first of all, identify an appropriate group of stakeholders, what I refer to as operational readiness. Who are the right people that we need to get into a room? There's an education process that takes place. Joining the podcast today is Doug McConey, PwC's International Tax Services Global Leader and also a fellow podcaster. Doug hosts the Cross-Border Tax Talks podcast, where PwC partners and guests discuss tax developments at the U.S. and global levels. In true podcaster form, Doug also took me out of the host chair and put me in the guest seat on his own podcast. Be sure to link to that episode in the show notes. And if you enjoy hearing Doug today, I definitely encourage you to check out more of his content. But in the meantime, it's all about Doug's perspectives on Pillar 2 and how it'll be impacting companies in the near and longer term. With that, here's my conversation with Doug. All right, Doug, welcome to the podcast. It's our first crossover episode, so I hope we have an opportunity to do some more of these. Uh, But I thought maybe since... I'm sure some of my audience has heard your own podcast, but not all. Before we get into the heart of things, can you just give a little background about yourself? Yeah. Doug McConey, PwC's International Tax Services Global Leader, have been in the role for about the past 18 months. Before that, I led our U.S. International Tax Services practice for four years and really do all things cross-border tax. My background is as a lawyer. I do have an accounting degree, never sat for the CPA. And then about five years ago, I started the Cross-Border Tax Talks podcast, um, where we publish every two weeks. You can find that anywhere you find your podcasts. And I also uh, do a video version that I put up the podcast out on YouTube. So really excited, uh, Heather, to be able to sit down with you. And I will will tell you that it's a, a little awkward being on this side of the microphone. I'm, I'm used to answering the questions, but I'm very excited to turn the tables around after this podcast and uh, have you on the Cross-Border Tax Talks podcast. Yes. And, and for the audience's benefit, I had the same fear. And so I asked Doug if I could go first and ask the questions first before I had to answer them. So so anyway, um, you will also catch me on Doug's podcast and we'll give more information about that at the end because I definitely want uh, you guys to have an opportunity to hear that. But so Doug, I, I would say my knowledge of cross-border tax is dealing with cross-border loans and seeing, you know, making sure that they are loans. So I know you will go way beyond that. But for today, we're focused on Pillar 2. And we have done some prior Pillar 2 episodes episodes, but I think for the audience's benefit, just if you can even remind people what we mean when we say Pillar 2 and a little bit of background, and then we'll get into some more current developments. Sure. And in the industry, we like to use words like unprecedented very, very often. And that's not unique to tax. I know we we say that too (laughs) in accounting as well, but this really, Heather, is unprecedented. I might go so far as calling it revolutionary in the field of global tax. Historically, individual countries would have their own corporate tax system. We've never really had a global tax system. And this is the first global tax system of its, of its type. It's a global minimum tax designed to ensure that companies pay at least 15% tax anywhere they do business. And what's important for listeners to know that this applies for what's referred to as multinational enterprises or what we would commonly think of as multinational companies that have greater than 750 million euro revenue. Now, the OECD, which set up the basic framework for these rules, 140 countries have signed on. And we'll unpack exactly how many countries have actually implemented in 2024, Mm -hmm. what some of the practical implications are. But what's really interesting about this, in addition to just being the first global tax of its type, is that it's based on book income using the financial accounting standard of the ultimate parent entity with a whole myriad of different adjustments that are required to actually get to the starting tax base. 
Um, it applies to branches, partnerships, corporations. And what's particularly important to know for given this is an accounting podcast is that if there is an entity that's immaterial, that doesn't matter for pillar two. Companies still have to do the compliance and the calculation for all what is referred to as constituent entities. And we'll talk a little bit more about what constituent entities are. I do think, Heather, it's important to talk about the applicable provisions, really the key framework for Pillar 2, because they're really kind of four primary operating rules. The first is an income inclusion rule. And for your listeners that are familiar with the U.S. tax guilty, mm-hmm. which generally allows a parent company to collect a top-up tax from its subsidiaries, the income inclusion rule in the Pillar 2 framework is really similar to guilty. However, again, it's based on book income. There is no jurisdictional blending. It has to be done on a country by country basis or actually a constituent entity. And then you aggregate the the countries together. That income inclusion rule is generally effective for 2024 for those implementing jurisdictions. Another important piece is what's referred to as the undertax profit rule. This used to be called the undertax payment rule when it was based on payments. And generally what the undertax profit rule does is that it allows a subsidiary to collect a top-up tax either from its parent or one of its brother-sister companies. Now, there's all kinds of questions with respect to taxing authority and dispute resolution, but the framework sets out this undertax profit rule will apply starting in 2025 and could potentially allow an implementing jurisdiction that sits below, let's say, a parent company that has not adopted these rules like the U.S. to potentially collect a top-up tax. Now, there's all kinds of exceptions and particular safe harbors. But important to know, income inclusion rule allows a parent to collect from the the sub. The undertax profit rule allows a sub to collect from really anywhere in the group. And that's 2025. That will be um, mayhem when when that kicks in. The other third piece is what's referred to as the qualified domestic minimum top-up tax. And the OECD wanted to allow jurisdictions to effectively collect the top-up tax from itself. In other words, instead of allowing a parent company Mm -hmm. to collect a a top-up tax from a sub or a brother-sister company to collect the top-up tax, it effectively allows an implementing jurisdiction to implement its own qualified domestic minimum top-up tax based on the same framework of those rules so that they're not ceding taxing authority to another jurisdiction. There's a fourth piece that's really less relevant called the subject to tax rule. That's more with a withholding tax type mechanism for developing countries. The ordering of these is important in that the QDMTT generally comes first. But what's interesting, Heather, about the QDMTTs in particular is that the OECD gave a lot of deference to implementing jurisdictions and how they bring in the QDMTT rules. Because just to remind listeners, the OECD generally provides guidance, right, or a framework of what the rules, but each jurisdiction has to go through their own legal process to implement these rules themselves. For the QDMTT. And and before you keep going, (laughs) just for our listeners who are trying to keep up, which tax is the QDMTT? The QDMTT is the Qualified Domestic Minimum Top-Up Tax that allows a jurisdiction. So first one. That goes first. That's the first one. And so it allows a country to collect the top-up tax from itself before then applying the income inclusion rule. And then the third in line is the undertax profit rule. Okay. All right. And this is the simplified version. Yes, I know. And it's just all these acronyms get so confusing so fast. So I might keep interrupting you for other ones. But yes. Okay. So go on. I'm Please sorry. Do. You were explaining about the QDMTT, which just rolls off the tongue. It does so. really roll off the tongue. <laughs> so the, the QDMTT generally allows countries or countries that implement the QDT some deference in how they actually bring in the rules. The income inclusion rule, under tax profit rule, there's model rules, there's commentary, there's three sets of administrative guidance. But the QDMTT allows countries some flexibility in how they operate the rule. And what's really important for listeners to note is that the QDMTT can be based instead of on the financial accounting standard of the ultimate parent entity, jurisdictions have the option of allowing that to be based on local statutory account as opposed to wow. U.S. GAAP okay. or, or yeah. IFRS. And so you can imagine just from a data perspective mm-hmm. that there's just an insane amount of information and data that's required both for income inclusion rule, the UTPR, based on the financial accounting system of the ultimate parent entity, and then with the QDMTT, some jurisdictions may choose to base that on local stat. The reason for that, Heather, is that 
I think that the OECD acknowledged that some jurisdictions, just from an administrability perspective, may be challenged doing calculations. Imagine a U.S. sub or a U.S. parent with, let's say, a U.K. subsidiary or a French subsidiary or whatever. I think the thought was is that it may be easier to administer if instead of it being based on U.S. gap for that U.S. parent, that it could be based on local stat. Now, interestingly, the UK for their QDMTT based it on the financial accounting standard of the ultimate parent entity, but we're seeing a number of jurisdictions use local stats. So it's countries have the option of how they want to to do. Yeah, that. and I say that can get very complicated quickly, right? Because given differences in these different gaps, you could wind up with, I guess, some amounts that are taxed effectively twice. Uh, or otherwise or in different periods. I mean, it just, it's kind of mind boggling when you start thinking about all the differences between the different gaps and then how that interacts with these rules. Absolutely. And then how jurisdictions deal with those gaps. In other words, does the qualified domestic minimum top up tax just effectively turn off any income? Yeah, that's what I was, rule yeah, that or was. UTPR, which I think in, in, in theory is the intention of the rules, but Again, every jurisdiction will bring in the rules themselves and has to go through their own legislative process. And we're already starting to see some differences where maybe the QDMTT doesn't turn off the income inclusion or UTPR. So to the extent that there is a delta, there still could potentially be a top-up tax to the extent that that pillar two rate is below 15%. Maybe the last piece, kind of important puzzle piece, is something referred to as the three-year transitional safe harbor. So the OECD wanted to provide taxpayers some flexibility and a transition to be able to actually get to these full, what's referred to as globe income calculation, the full pillar two calculation. So they will allow taxpayers to effectively use income as reported on a qualifying country by country report for the first three years. And there are three particular tests to be able to meet the transitional safe harbor, which is probably more detail than we need to get into for this. But many companies and, and taxpayers that we've spoken to are looking at, at trying to take advantage of the transitional safe harbor because theoretically it means less work than having to do the full pillar two calculations. And now that is just transitional and there are a whole bunch of issues and complexities associated with that as well. One thing on that point, it's interesting, is that this seems sudden. And I know it's not. I know the OECD has been talking about Pillar 2 for quite some time, but it seems between the time between when Pillar 2 was finalized and now when we're talking about actual implementation, it has been a very short period of time, at least it seems like relatively, although I feel like you tax people move fast. Well, um, I I did do a podcast on this topic for the UK rules called Painting While the Paint is Dry. And I think that many of us in the profession, whether it's accounting and tax, are used to rules being fully developed, fully established, lots of public discussion, and then the rules get proposed and enacted. Well, here we're, to to mix metaphors, we're flying the airplane while it's being (laughs) built. Right. The original model rules and commentary came out and it, boy, in December of 2021. I can't decide if that seems like a really long time ago or if it was just a couple weeks ago. Yeah, both. I think both. (laughs) But it was December 2021 when these rules originally were proposed. We've seen three sets of administrative guidance that have come out, and then it really has been kind of a trickle of implementing jurisdictions. 36 countries have enacted or will be enacting the rules in 2024. That's kind of an ish number. Generally, that includes all of the countries in the EU, um, except for a couple of the smaller countries that don't have um, you know, more than 12 multinational enterprises within their jurisdiction, Malta and a, and a couple of others. But recently, it was uh, it was disclosed that Poland, who does is supposed to have these the income inclusion rule effective in 2024, they did not get their legislation through their process. And because of constitutionality requirements, may not be able to do it now retroactively back to 2024. But where we are today here in early 2024, you know, we have 36 countries-ish that have or will be enacting. A number of countries are still bringing their legislation in and it will be retroactive. We're expecting in 2025, the OECD has said another 40 to 50 countries that will likely be enacted. And again, 140 countries have signed on. One important thing to note is that the U.S. has signed on to this but will not be Mm -hmm. enacting these Pillar 2 rules. We'll see what happens with elections this year, and there's some major changes to U.S. international tax provisions that will effectively kind of come in in 2026. That seems to be a time when, obviously, depending who controls Congress, who controls the presidency, what could happen. But the U.S. will not be implementing these rules. But 
even though the U.S. is not implementing these rules and a number of other jurisdictions like India, China, elsewhere are not implementing these rules, if you're a parented company based in that jurisdiction, you still need to comply with these rules. Because mm-hmm. if you operate in any jurisdiction that is implementing, whether it's the income inclusion rule or the qualified domestic minimum top-up tax in 2024, even if your parent company is not in a location that has implemented these rules, you're still, taxpayers are still going to have to comply with those. This is the part that I actually find confusing because, so if I'm a U.S. company and I have subsidiaries that are subject to this in other places, if I understood one of your pieces correctly, then they can come and say, oh, well, U.S. company, you didn't pay your minimum in the U.S., so we're going to take that tax here. So it's almost like the U.S. should want to implement the 15 percent. I mean, that is certainly one policy justification for why the U.S. could or should implement these rules. It is important to note that the U.S. Treasury was able to negotiate with the OECD a a safe harbor for U.S. parented groups that generally postpones the application of that Mm. under tax profit rule, coincidentally. to to 2026, even though those rules could potentially apply in in 2025. But to just take the example of a U.S. parented group, if you have a really flat structure, so all of your foreign subsidiaries Mm -hmm. are held directly by the U.S., then the thing for those taxpayers to keep in mind is the qualified domestic minimum top-up taxes in 2024, which of those jurisdictions are implementing the the qualified domestic minimum top-up taxes. And then in 2025, to the extent that you're operating in one of those jurisdictions that has the under tax profit rule, that's when you the a subsidiary could potentially get a top up tax from brother sister companies in in 2025. Wow, so it's definitely a huge amount to think about here, and very key, I guess, for tax professionals to pay attention. And I was going to get to this later, but before we get any deeper, if I'm the controller listening, because that's you know, a lot of our audience, can can they just say, I'm sorry, tax VP, please take care of this? Or, or what do you think they need to know we'll, here? We'll, we'll unpack a little bit more of this, but like it is a multifunctional uh, group and stakeholders that needs to be involved in this. And in fact, Heather, just leading this charge globally for PwC, when I started this endeavor almost two years ago, um, it was shocking to me the number of stakeholders that are required, even just for PwC. And I, what we're seeing is taxpayers have a similar issue. So oftentimes this starts with the tax department. I think that's kind of why it ended up on on my <laughs> plate, right? But what we have found out that you need systems people, the controllership needs to be involved. There's tons of accounting questions, both with respect to tax accounting, as well as I like to refer to Heather accounting, accounting (laughs) issues. And so we've had to have, so there are a number of stakeholders because really the way I think about this, Heather, this requires taxpayers to set up an entirely new set of books, Um, whether you want to call it a third set of books or, and then there are attributes Mm -hmm. and certain things that need to be tracked. But don't be fooled by, well, this is based on book income, the financial accounting standard, the ultimate parent entity. There are a whole number of adjustments that need to take place, which we can talk about. Um, but, but for controllers, it's important to work with the systems people. It's important to talk to the tax people because it really is a big lift to be able to get all the data that's needed to even start the calculations. All right. And we can we can get to that at the end. I was just thinking it was also worth mentioning now so that people are not sure. thinking, oh, I, I'm going to go to the next episode and not stay tuned for the rest of this one. So I think we've started covering some of these terms, but maybe it would be helpful to go through some of those key provisions again and some of the mechanics of how this is going to differ from what existing practice is. Yeah, so the way the the Pillar 2 rules generally work is that to determine whether a particular constituent entity and ultimately a jurisdiction as you combine those constituent entities meets that 15% Pillar 2 rate, the calculation is covered taxes over what's referred to as globe income. And so that's this book income with a whole number of adjustments. The transitional safe harbor has a similar numerator, so covered taxes, but the denominator is the income reported on a qualifying country-by-country report. So idea being that taxpayers who already have a good country-by-country report, they don't have to go through all the full globe income calculation, all the adjustments, and can use that. Again, it's a three-year transitional safe harbor. There are tons of adjustments. And maybe I'll just mention a a few kind of common ones that we're seeing in practice. 
Uh, dividends are excluded from at, at the shareholder level from income. So typically, I think we might see those in book income. Those need to, to be adjusted out. There are adjustments for share disposal losses. Those are not included in globe income. Stock compensation needs to be adjusted. There are some elections allowed with respect to stock compensation. Adjustments for asymmetric foreign currency gains um, with respect to covered taxes, dividend withholding taxes are actually pushed down to the payer. I think many of us in tax are used to that being the who the obligor, who the legal obligor is. And so those get get pushed down. Valuation allowances are excluded. One of the really big ones, Heather, is there's an adjustment for deferred taxes. So to the extent that you have deferred taxes, mm. those need to be adjusted down to 15% to the, the pillar two rate. And then there's also some really complex um, and, and just how do companies comply related to long-term deferred tax liabilities that don't reverse within five years. Those need to be taken out of the pillar two calculations. Now, the question is, and I've talked to a number of accounting people, is who's actually looking to see if there's a five-year turn on long-term deferred right. tax liabilities? Not many that we've seen. And so this is just another process and something the taxpayers are going to have to, to be aware of. Well, and also, I think if we go back to my question about who's responsible for this, knowing all these adjustments, tax person probably, but then knowing what the adjustments need to be, that's where your accounting people are that's going right. to need to be involved. I think from a practical perspective, yeah. we've seen tax leading this, yes. but working very closely yeah. with the with the accounting team yeah, and making sure that they understand what those adjustments could be and how things are accounted for. Um, you know, many, many clients and many taxpayers have a lot of top side adjustments, right? And some elimination company for, I've learned a lot about this, Heather, <laughs> over the course of the last 18 months and yeah. a little over my skis when I start talking about this, but there's oftentimes a lot of eliminations and maybe because stuff mm -hmm. all consolidates out, it doesn't actually get pushed down right. right to specific legal entities or constituent entities. Well, under the pillar two rules, those all need to, to be to be pushed down. And so, you know, it's really, it, obviously the tax people are not going to be familiar with what may sit no. at that Olimco or whatever. And so really critical that you're working with, the, the tax people are working with the accounting team to figure out how they push that down. Maybe a couple other points on the mechanics and the provisions that I think are relevant for, for people. On, on the numerator with respect to covered taxes, there's a, a, a question or there's this concept in the Pillar 2 rules referred that relates to tax credits. And generally, refundable tax credits are considered good Pillar 2 taxes, and non-refundable tax credits are considered bad Pillar 2 taxes. And so if you have a non-refundable tax credit, that generally comes out of the numerator and gets added to the denominator for the purposes of the Pillar 2 calculation. The practical implication of this, and let me give an example, is for a, a U.S. subsidiary, let's say, of a foreign parented group. Let's take a U.K. parented group where the U.S. is taking advantage of the research and development mm -hmm. tax credit, the R&D tax credit. That is a non-refundable tax credit. Interestingly, in the U.K., they have an R&D credit that is refundable. But so for if, if you're a, a U.S. company, whether foreign parented or U.S. parented, whenever the, the under tax profit rules kick in, if you're taking the R&D credit and other general business credits could be impacted by this too, then that R&D credit is generally not considered a good credit for purposes of pillar two. It comes out of your numerator and then gets added to the, to the denominator. And what that means is, we, what generally what that means is, is that companies that even though the statutory rate in the U.S. is above 21%, mm -hmm. we're seeing a lot of examples and, you know, you add 4 or 5% for state, we're talking 25, 26. It is very common where the U.S. Pillar 2 rate, because of this refundable versus non-refundable credit, creates the pillar, causes the Pillar 2 rate to fall below 15%. Now, again, that's just an example with the U.S. The Pillar 2 also brought in something really kind of specific for the U.S. for the Inflation Reduction yeah, Act. Yeah, that was one of my questions. Green actually. energy credits. Yeah. yeah. Um, to the extent that a credit meets the definition of a transferable credit, this was something that was introduced into administrative guidance that came out in July of 2023. Those Inflation Reduction Act credits generally are good credits for Pillar 2 and would not potentially not significantly dilute your Pillar 2 rate. But it's also important to remember that 
These are just model rules, the commentary, the administrative guidance. What we're seeing in practice is that as jurisdictions start to enact the rules, they may, whether it's intentionally or unintentionally deviating from some of these exceptions, maybe not bringing in certain aspects of the Pillar 2 guidance. So despite the fact that there's this guidance that the OECD has, has put out there, it's also very possible that a jurisdiction may not incorporate all of that guidance. And so you really have to go country by country to see what rules apply, how they apply, and what implications do they have on a particular taxpayer's fact pattern. So I probably should know the answer to this question, but refundable tax credit versus non-refundable tax credit, what is sort of the key difference there? I think the intention of the OECD was that above the line versus below the line, kind of based on these accounting principles. Um, but for for those that aren't as familiar with like generally a refundable tax credit allows a company to be able to then, you know, to if they if they cannot use the tax credit to reduce their actual taxes, they can then go get a refund from the government. Yeah, get cash basically. Get so actual- yeah. So I think I, I'm going to chime in. So for our listeners, we probably would have referred to those previously as just like cash payment. Right or cash. So that is the type we're talking about. And then that, I guess, ties together why specifically then for the IRA, we were talking about these transferable credits because that was a whole new concept, right? Yeah. And 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 the concern that U.S. Treasury and the U.S. administration had was that companies would be taking advantage of these massive green energy credits under the Inflation Reduction Act and then potentially some other country, if it was a U.S. subsidiary of, let's say, a Korean parent or a German parented group or whatever the case, could then collect the top-up tax uh, based on you know the incentive that the U.S. was trying to encourage for green energy. And so really, that is it was a big step. And I think it's important just for, for companies that are located in a non-U.S. parented group to make sure that their particular their country's rules mm-hmm. have incorporated those transferable tax credits into their domestic legislation to make sure that they're not going to potentially owe a top-up tax in the U.S. Yeah, the other thing that's interesting here that struck me as soon as you started talking about this is we've also previously talked here on the podcast about the other EU rules, the foreign subsidies regulation, which also require if you have various types of government subsidies, then additional reporting and an additional process. So again, these government subsidies are, you know, I, I know you're talking about them in the context of tax, but they are subsidies as well. So it is interesting to see them popping up in a few different places. So one other th- question then on sort of these adjustments and otherwise is, you know, we talk about this 15% minimum tax, but then within the U.S., we do have the CAMT. So that seems like we should automatically meet this 15%. So can you just explain the interaction of those two things? This is a a very common question and misconception on, because when that rule came out, when that rule was initially proposed and then enacted, it was called the book minimum tax. And I think many were like, well, this must be a pillar two book minimum tax. And it is based generally on 15% and it's based on book income. But unfortunately for taxpayers, Heather, that is where the similarities end. Um, it is a completely different tax base based on applicable financial statement income for Camp T as opposed to this based on the financial accounting standard. The adjustments are different. It needs to be done um, on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis, just really completely different rules. One trap for the unwary, if there are taxpayers that are in the camp, the camp T, the book minimum tax, <laughs> uh, there's, it's referred to by all different types of acronyms and things, is that the camp T is really just a timing difference as, you know, it's really like an alternative minimum tax right. and generally creates a tax credit. So if you end up in the camp T in one year and then the following year you're out of the camp T, you can use those credits to reduce your U.S. tax liability in future years. Those tax credits, Heather, are not refundable. Ah. And so to the extent that if you're a non-U.S. parented group, operate in the U.S., have a Camp T, you pay the Camp T in 2024, and then in 2025, you end up getting a refund. You may be getting a reduction of your U.S. tax that you then just need to pay a top-up tax to whoever that ultimate parent entity is. So there are a number of things that taxpayers can do proactively to stay out of the camp through, through methods changes and timing and that kind of thing. So really important for taxpayers to be mindful of. If you're subject to the pillar two rules, you probably don't want to be in the camp if it is somewhat in your control. Yeah. So some tax planning opportunity perhaps there. Uh, and, and definitely seems like a lot to think about. And I guess 
Doug, you said this before, but I think it's an important point. We haven't really seen how this is going to work in operation yet, right? Because we have our 36-ish countries for 2024, more coming in 2025. But how this actually operationalizes Yeah, with respect to dispute resolutions, with respect to actually filing requirements, the OECD has put out what's referred to as the globe information return. It really is more like a list of data requirements, frankly, than what I would consider a traditional tax return. The qualified domestic minimum top-up taxes, which again come first in priority that each individual jurisdiction may be able to enact themselves, there's really no guidance on what those forms should look like. So very likely that each jurisdiction could have different forms and obviously depending on the local language or whatever that case may be. And so really more questions than answers on the actual operation of this and as we start thinking about dispute resolution. But it is important to note that the um, for both U.S. GAAP as well as IFRS, and this is more in your area than my area, but they have said that the period accounting will be allowed for this. So that they don't need to do deferred tax accounting because I don't even know how you would do deferred tax accounting. It would be very challenging, I think, to do deferred tax accounting for something yes. like, like Pillar 2. For IFRS filers, those companies had to do some disclosure for mm-hmm. 2023, and then in 2024, they'll need to be period accounting. And then um, same thing with with U.S. GAAP gap filers. One of the practical implications or challenges, I think, that you know, as, as we've started to, to have discussions with auditors and taxpayers have had discussions with auditors, there are a number of taxpayers that would say, well, the amount of top-up tax that we have is immaterial. And you know they don't maybe they don't operate in any jurisdiction that is below fifteen percent. Maybe they don't have a lot of refundable credits. Maybe none of these adjustments create any issue. And so I think the challenge for both filers as well as auditors is how do you establish right. immateriality for a tax that never existed before without actually showing what those calculations are. And so you know my advice is for for folks is to talk to your auditors, mm-hmm. um, start those discussions. Uh, Q one is right around the corner at the corner, and then we'll be at year for 2024 before we know it, where there'll need to be a certainly more precision with respect to what, if any, top-up taxes do. Well, so I think that's a helpful point. And I think it's also interesting because as we talk about this, this is a, so different than what we've historically thought of from a tax perspective. And so if I am a company that's listening to your warning and saying Q1's coming, uh, we mentioned very briefly some of the considerations, but really as you're talking to companies that are overwhelmed by all these different terminology, all the different countries, all the different potential sort of flavors of implementation here, where are you telling them to start? Well, I think there's a number of different places that can start. One of the things that I learned is that taxpayers take a variety of different approaches on how they're going to start, which is okay. And some start with more of the data, the operational readiness aspects. Some have started doing initial modeling. Some companies are looking at their structures. But the first place that I always suggest the taxpayers start is to really do what is referred to as a constituent entity analysis. And what that means is who's got to file where and what potential entities, again, partnerships, Mm pass-through, branches, what constituent entities are potentially in scope. There are special rules that apply for joint ventures. There are these things called partially owned parent entities, POPE, some more acronyms for you, Heather. There's MOKES, minority owned constituent (laughs) entities. But there's a big analysis of the legal org chart that needs to take place. It's generally easier for big public companies because that's the ultimate parent entity. It's a public company. But as we think about asset wealth management Mm -hmm. and more of the private sector, um, high net worth individuals, that calculation gets significantly more complicated. There are challenges for those in like the insurance industry and others because there are exceptions for investment entities. And so really the starting point is just how big a problem is this or where do we – problem being do we have a top-up tax but also who actually needs to comply, where do we – we need to comply, who's going to do the actual filings. The second place that I would encourage folks to, to take a look at is many companies are saying that they think they can meet the transitional safe harbor um, because they operate in a high statutory rate. There's no big adjustments. But to be able to meet the transitional safe harbor, you have to have a qualifying country by country report, which means it needs to be either based on book income or the based on the financial accounting standard, the ultimate parent. You could also potentially use local stat. There are new rules that just came out in the most recent administrative guidance with respect to push down accounting and how that could potentially disqualify your country by country report. 
A practical issue is that historically country by country reports, because it was just a filing, right? It never, it never actually resulted in any tax. Those would often be done kind of later in mm-hmm. the year, just from an overall process and data perspective. And so now if companies are going to be relying on the transitional safe harbor, you probably need to accelerate the country by country process so that you can be able to show your auditors and actually get comfortable that you can meet the safe harbor and don't have any top up taxes. So one of the things that struck me, you said, who's going to actually do the filings? And again, I know this is early days for many companies, but as you're talking to companies, are you seeing companies centralize this or is it sort of decentral where they're trying to get all of their different subsidiary teams involved? Or I'm sure it's a mix, but any thoughts on that? Yes. What the, the general suggestion is a centralized approach because these rules are based on the financial accounting system yes. of the ultimate parent entity. You know, you think about U.S. gap filers. I mean, how familiar really are the foreign subsidiaries right. of the U.S. familiar with U.S. gap to be able to, to do these calculations? What, what I found in my travels around the globe is yeah. that, you know, the U.S. has really big tax departments, generally speaking. Of mm-hmm. course, there's exceptions to the rule. But Japan, as an example, has historically taken a very decentralized approach to their tax departments and generally rely on their foreign subsidiaries to do local filing. And so depending on the business culture, tax culture of the particular jurisdiction, and of course, it has to be looked at on an entity by mm-hmm. on a, on a taxpayer by taxpayer basis, I think the general advice is that this needs to be done from a centralized perspective. Now, when we start thinking about the qualified domestic minimum top-up taxes and to the extent there may be local filings and there may be uh, the ability to be able to use local statutory accounting, there's going to need to be a lot of team teaming that goes on. But the fact is, is that because QDMTT goes first, you know, it may or may not completely turn off the income inclusion rule. There really needs to be a centralized model for for purposes of doing these calculations. Yeah. And actually, part of the reason I asked the question is just, again, when I was thinking of all the complexity you described, if you were taking a decentralized approach, it seems like it could be very easy for something to get missed versus if you have one team sort of looking at all of it. That's certainly our advice. Yes. All right. Very good. Thank you. And so then what are some of the other considerations in terms of thinking in particular, I I guess one that comes to mind is data. Where are you going to get it? Do you have the right data? Yeah. And this is something I've learned a lot about, Heather, in the last (laughs) 18 months. Like I'm a tax lawyer, as I mentioned, by background and hadn't spent a lot of time with data. How about controls? Have you been learning about controls? I've learned a lot about that. All right. So we can talk about both of those. I've learned a a, a lot about data and controls. (laughs) So one of the first things that we did, Heather, when these rules came out was figure out what what, what data is actually needed. And we Mm -hmm. actually published something called our data input catalog, which we continue to update. I think we're on our second or third public version of this, and we continue to update it. And generally, believe it or not, there are at least 260 data points needed for every constituent entity to be able to do these full calculations. From our experience, we think that roughly maybe 50% of that information can be found within a client's ERP system which means, you know, generally 40 to 60%, which means that 40 to 60% of that information cannot. And then the question is, well, where is that data? Where is that information? Well, sometimes it's in provision software. Maybe it's in um, tax compliance software. Oftentimes, some of this information is sitting in somebody's hard drive on a spreadsheet. Some of this information not even exists, like the whether your deferred liabilities are going to flip within five years. So it for those taxpayers that have not started this process, the data is certainly the first really big challenge. Now, of course, doing the calculations is a challenge in and of itself, but that the data needs is really where taxpayers need to, to start focusing immediately if they haven't already to identify where is that data located. And of course, many taxpayers have multiple ERP systems yeah. and some are going through an ERP tra- transformation. For those companies that are going through an ERP transformation, I actually view this as a great opportunity to get kind of that pillar two process mm-hmm. plugged in or as part of that process to be able to identify the the data needs. And then frankly, gathering the data is just one piece. We then need to transform that data into what we refer to as the data input catalog, but into the, the relevant information that we need to actually feed the, the calculations. And then when you say feed the calculations, 
is this spreadsheets or are is it software or how are people dealing with that? Well, there are a number of different solutions that that are out in the marketplace with respect to to calculation engines. What's important for people as they're assessing the the calculation engine, and and in full disclosure, PwC has a pillar two engine, which I've spent an extraordinary (laughs) amount of time developing, um, and I'm certainly partial to, to. But one of the first really big challenges is just the volume of data and the complexity of the calculations. And I think what we're seeing from talking to a a number of folks, as well as also some of the internal work that we've done, that given the volume of data – and the complexity of the calculations that trying to do this in a spreadsheet can be very challenging. Well, yeah, I was thinking 260 data points as to even if you have only, you know, 10 companies, you're already up to 2,600 and then you have to do something and right. then that's multiply. And it could be like if there's local stat, yeah. like that could double, right? right? Because you're going to need information under local stat and you may yeah. need also need yeah. information yeah. based on the financial accounting standard of the ultimate parent entity. Yeah. So that is one challenge of just whatever calculation engine that taxpayers are going to consider. It has to be able to deal with the volume of data and the complexity of the calculations. The other big challenge for uh, for the calculations is, is there a centralized rules engine? Because as I mentioned, each jurisdiction has to implement these rules themselves. And what we have found in practice is that some countries are making intentional policy decisions to potentially deviate from the model rules, the commentary, and the administrative guidance. Some jurisdictions, just because of the nature of the way their constitutional or legislative process work, may not be able to incorporate, let's say, the administrative guidance that just came out in December of 2023. That may not be able to be automatically included into their domestic legislation. And so there will be differences that occur between these rules with different jurisdictions. And so for those taxpayers that are trying to do these calculations themselves, like, do you really have tax technical experts and all of these various mm-hmm. countries to help understand what those rules are? We're also seeing in the market that, you know, there are some kind of DIY type approaches where you kind of get an empty box and taxpayers are effectively required to build those rules. I will tell you from experience working with our over 150 countries and particularly the 36 countries that have implemented, it's challenging. And we have incredible subject matter specialists uh, around the globe. The last important piece to to consider when considering a calculation engine is how are these rules going to be updated? Mm -hmm. And because this is not going to be stagnant, right? That we've already, we've got administrative guidance that came out in December. The OECD said that future administrative guidance, and then each country is going to have to go through whatever their process is to incorporate that future administrative of guidance. So who's going to be keeping up with those changes, right, for purposes of the calculation? And not surprisingly, our Pillar 2 engine uh, incorporates all of that with the, with the centralized rules engine, and it's a graph database to deal with massive amounts of data. All right. Well, this was not a planted question. I literally did want to know what you were supposed to do. So it's very interesting uh, to hear that. So then we we did sort of talk about this, but I think it's helpful to now with all this additional context, take a step back and say, okay, now I'm the controller. I've heard all this. I'm in a panic. So I call my tax VP. But what should be happening? Like if you're thinking of a best practice company right now, where are they? And what would you say to companies who kind of need to catch up? Yeah, the best practice companies, first of all, identify an appropriate group of stakeholders, what I refer to as operational readiness. Who are the right people that we need to get into a room? There's an education process that takes place because you bring controllership, you bring in Mm -hmm. the the systems people, and they are like, what in the heck are you tax people talking about? And not everybody, which is a shock to me, Heather's that excited to talk about tax. And when you put tax on the calendar, people may not be that excited. Although I don't know, once they start this conversation, they might get a little worked up. So so, so starting with the operational readiness yeah. is, is, is a critical component. And then working through and thinking through what data is needed. Can we meet the safe harbor? So some initial modeling, mm-hmm. some kind of high level to start bucketing the potential constituent entities. Can we meet the transitional safe harbor? Can we, you know, do we have to do the full globe income calculation and really starting to think about what data needs and then what processes need to potentially be able to change, to be updated. For example, as I mentioned, the country by country kind of accelerating that process, really putting in a a roadmap for how are we going to, to address this. And then once that data is is gathered, then doing those calculations more at a more granular level and starting those discussions with auditors, you know, particularly for calendar year, mm-hmm. I would highly encourage 
because you know Q1 will be here before you know it. I know a lot of, uh, of companies are focused on year end, um, and then really when we get to to year end, making sure that you know that first provision for for pillar two is as 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 accurate as as it can be, and then finally really thinking about a calculation engine for purposes of provision for purposes of a compliance grade calculation is really something that taxpayers should really start to to consider to make sure that they're they're partnering with the right service provider technology, or even if they're trying to do it themselves and making sure that they have those capabilities given the complexity of the rules and the dynamic nature of the rules. So maybe getting close to final question, if not the final, one of the things that I often hear from my tax colleagues is that pretty much anything you do from a business, you should be thinking about tax as well. And it seems like, yeah, after listening to this, the number of potential business implications has to go far beyond what we've talked about today. So what are some of the things that you would say this needs to be sort of as soon as possible built into the process? Well, I will tell you, the pillar two implications should be layered into every business transaction. See, I knew you were going to be like every other tax person. (laughs) Right. Well, it's (laughs) It's the biggest expense on any company's income statement, right? Generally, taxes is the biggest and this really is just like a third or maybe even a fourth dimension mm-hmm. that companies need to, to think about. So, for example, due diligence, if companies are doing deals, understanding the impact of Pillar 2 on a future ETR calculation, and that's hard because we don't have a lot of the data, we need to make a number of assumptions. There are also, Heather, transitional rules that apply for transactions that occurred starting in December of 2021. So even though these rules don't actually apply until 2024, the OECD was concerned that taxpayers may try to do proactive type Mm -hmm. planning, for Mm -hmm. example, to create book step-ups as an example to potentially reduce their pillar two. And so to the extent that there were potentially intercompany asset transfers or other similar transactions that occurred since these rules were proposed in December of 2021, those could impact the, the pillar two calculations and ultimately the amount of pillar two tax that's owed. I mentioned that there are special rules for partially owned entities. So to the extent that there are joint ventures, whether new or existing, understanding who is potentially liable for the tax, the way these rules work and with consolidation, it is possible that a taxpayer, for example, may own less than 100% of an entity, but still effectively be required to include that 100% of that low tax entity into their pillar two calcs. So presumably you might want to have a discussion with your joint venture partner Mm -hmm. to say, hey, I'm paying 100% of a top up tax when I only own own less than a, a percentage point. Um, To the extent that taxpayers have done step-up transactions, so sort of book tax differences, um, those those generally have to be clawed back for for purposes of of Pillar 2. And then maybe I'll I'll end with, and this certainly is an inclusive list, on intercompany debt. Um, To the extent that maybe there is what we would refer to in tax as hybrid debt, so maybe something that's considered debt for book purposes Mm -hmm. and equity for tax, uh, redeemable preferreds come to mind. There's all kinds of examples. Well, There are special anti-abuse rules and rules that apply for those types of hybrid instruments. And recently in the administrative guidance, they they brought out some anti-abuse rules for purpose of the transitional safe harbor that can apply to these hybrid type arrangements. And there are similar type of rules, at least somewhat limited, but the OECD has said they're going to bring those into the full pillar two rules. So really understanding historic intercompany debt, and particularly if you've got preferreds or anything where there may be a book tax difference, important to understand what the pillar two implications could be of those types of arrangements. All right. Well, that was definitely a complete list, but maybe just to wrap things up then, any final thoughts for our audience? I think the the final thoughts are, this is a challenge for everybody. I think this has been a big challenge for service providers, um, as well as for the actual taxpayers about really putting together the appropriate expertise. Mm -hmm. And so for those that feel overwhelmed, all I can say is I I empathize. Um, If you haven't started, you probably need to start immediately. I think there are some fiscal school year taxpayers that maybe have waited a little bit Mm -hmm. because they feel like they have some extra time. But the amount of time that we've seen on just the front end data side, depending on how good a shape your data is in and your country by country report can take a lot of time. So start early, bring in those right stakeholders and know that everybody is going through this together. All right. Well, definitely some great words of wisdom there. And thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. That's our show for today. 
Tune in next week for more fresh episodes so that you never miss any of our audio content. Follow the PwC Accounting Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And to stay up to date on all our latest accounting and reporting news, sign up for our newsletter at viewpoint.pwc.com. From Thought Leadership at PwC, I'm Heather Horn. Thanks for tuning in. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates, and they sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com slash structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors, including accountants and lawyers.